A wise man once said that there was just one ring to rule them all. But nothing was said about there being only one Lord of the Rings card game. No, no, no. When most people think of Middle Earth cardboard in this year of the 2022, they think of the cooperative and themed-tastic Lord of the Rings to card game by Fantasy Flight. And whilst that is a stellar experience in its own right, our topic of discussion today is one of its thematic ancestors, the mighty Lord of the Rings trading card game. So epic, it refused to be called collectible. And what you'll learn here in this sermon if you choose to get comfortable is a very brief summary of why this game is so swish, and why you should be at one with it too sweet. We'll then segue to just how you can actually play this long since discontinued game. As mentioned at the outset then, if you google Lord of the Rings card game, you'll most commonly be met with the FFG co-op classic. But as good as it is, it simply doesn't bring the level of something that little bit different that the competitive dueling or even multiplayer trading card game boasts. In print between 2001 and 2007 to lap up the hype of the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movie trilogy, hence the screen cap artwork, the game pits you as both the free peoples and as the shadow forces trying to stop them, all in the same constructed deck. That's right, with a minimum 60 cards you must have an equal number of both, which on its own is enough to get the strumpet pump in. Your starting fellowship and free people's cards job then is to navigate the nine locations that mirror key pit stops in the films. And whilst your opponent is also racing their ring bearer to the finish line, on their turn, on your turn, they'll play in shadow cards in their hand that are there to hinder, obstruct, and otherwise moiety your erstwhile heroes. The movement, combat and ancillary card plays nothing groundbreaking, but well designed nonetheless. And you of course need to suspend disbelief that there are two Frodo's and two One Rings in the game, both trying to do the same thing. But the second reason this game is so bloody win, is that when a player has its fellowship phase, playing their free people's cards and chasing the win condition, they're also feeding their opponent's economy. You see, for every resource from an infinite pool they use, their opponent also gets a resource to then respond to what you've done in the shadow phase. Which is some of the sweetest tactical sauce a card game could employ to spice things up a little. There really is nothing to compare it to, but all that's left to say is if you haven't been sold on the game by now, then you likely never will be. So, you're either now fully intrigued by this long dead game, or you remember how painfully awesome it was is when you last played it back in the day, and you want to know how to get it to the table, physical or otherwise, on this, the 15th year since its passing. Well, the most obvious way of course is to get hold of the physical cards in the secondary market, and thankfully there are some reputable sellers still selling singles and sealed product for the game all these years later. Most of these I've lifted straight from the game's very own fan-led Players Council website. So the best bet is to just put a link to that in the description below and let you have at it. But one situational downside to this approach is that many of these retailers are US based, so shipping costs may well be an issue. Alternatively, no matter where you are in the world, you should have an eBay or equivalent that you can search for cards with. But to do that you need to know what the Donald you need to get first. Well, like most collectible trading card games, they do have starter sealed products that will work more than adequately as an introduction to the game. Most of these add rules inside the box and include a pre-constructed deck for you to dabble with immediately. Although strangely these mostly included only around 50 cards and didn't always incorporate an equal number of free peoples and shadows cards, so these should only be used to learn the game and play casually. And Captain Obvious should also remind you that these are for one player only, so you'll need more than one if it's you bringing the game to the table. You've then got the different formats to consider, of which there are more than a few, but I'm happy to simplify matters because the game was released in fairly well-defined blocks. The first three centering around the trilogy of movies. So the Fellowship block came first with one big and two small expansions, and then the Towers and Kings blocks did likewise. 
and because the locations in each were thematically tied to the source material, this to me is the most accessible way to play, especially if you're new to the game. In other words, pick your favourite movie and either pick up a couple of starters from that block, or if you're already damn sure you want this game in your life, then just pick up a job lot of cards and get your deck construction on. That to me is the most obvious way to step into the game, but they did release two more blocks before its demise in the official War of the Ring and the unofficial Hunters blocks, neither of which make for anything more than an inferior welcome to the game. And then there was of course the obligatory rotating standard format that just didn't sit well with the player base, most likely because of the above mentioned theming and the marketing knows best power creep and design choices. You've then got the legacy expanded and open formats that allowed you to use every card ever printed, with the only differences being the former had a ban list and the latter had a restricted list. Further details on all of the formats and the cards contained within every set, including the starter boxes we talked about earlier, can be found in the comprehensive wiki that will be your go-to factual resource if all this tickles your pickle. So that pretty much sums up the paper route, but in this age of the interwebs there must be a way to play this online, right? Well, yes there is, but it does use a somewhat aging platform named GEMP which although it does have its limitations, we're only dealing with a bloody card game, and so if it can accommodate the myriad mechanics and rules, then who are we to complain? Yes, you can find alternatives like mods for Tabletop Simulator and other even more aged platforms, but GEMP is the way I learnt to play the game online and seems to be the most popular. Links to GEMP can be found in the description and on both the aforementioned Players Council website and the wiki. And although it may not be the most polished interface, I had no trouble picking it up and it didn't come across any major hurdles or keyboard bashing issues with the interface. It's no frills and it does the job. To get started you'll need to import your own deck list manually or you can just copy and paste the deck list for the starter decks found in the wiki, which incidentally includes added cards to make them tournament legal. So them's the two traditional and straightforward ways to play, but there is of course another way to play Paper Lord of the Rings that I want to quickly touch on. Printing proxies of the originals. Now I'm not going to get into the ethics of this approach, but if a game is both discontinued and the company that published it is six feet under, then there ain't a chance it's getting reprinted. So food for thought. If you do want to consider this route though then check out my recent video on how I created the most authentic proxy I could muster. To help in this endeavour we can now also access high resolution AI upscaled versions of all the cards, once again via the Players Council, and props to those involved in this project. The original resolution images uploaded to the publisher Decipher's website back in the day would have been usable but suboptimal, but now you have access to high resolution facsimiles that have added acknowledgement that these are not original copies in place of the original copyright notice. So if you do have the patience to put your printer to work, then this may be a much more affordable option for you. It also has the added benefit of providing you with exactly what you need, nothing more, nothing less. And that just about sums up how you can Lord of the Rings the trading card game in 2022. Be sure to check out the Players Council Discord and loiter in Gemp if you're looking for someone to play with. I found the community to be very welcoming to new players and just trust me, you will not regret checking this all time classic out for the first time or dusting off your old decks in real space or over the Gemp waves. Alas, I have been the voice in your head and this video has ended.